This is the Music Hall of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 1997, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1997. We also look at the case for putting Blue Oyster Cult into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plus, our spotlight hall isn't a hall. It's the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in Washington, D.C. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1997. In music, the song Candle in the Wind, the Princess Diana edition, was first played at Princess Diana's funeral and then released as a single. It became the biggest selling single of the year and of all time worldwide. The biggest phenomenon of the year was also related to Great Britain, Spice Girl Mania, as the Spice Girls released their debut album, then released their movie Spice World at the end of the year. Other artists who burst onto the scene in 1997 included Third Eye Blind, The Backstreet Boys, Meredith Brooks, Duncan Sheik, Savage Garden, Paula Cole, Missy Misdemeanor Elliott, and Hanson. Radiohead released their iconic album OK Computer that year as well. Also out in 1997... Blank recordable CDs as the big three recording companies, TDK, Maxell, and Memorex, all put out different versions of that new technology. The Spice Girls album Spice was the biggest selling album of 1997, according to Billboard magazine. Other big albums were by Radiohead, U2, No Doubt, Notorious B.I.G., Puff Daddy, Mace, George Strait, Aerosmith, Scarface, Prodigy, Oasis, and Celine Dion. Aside from Elton's Candle in the Wind Princess Diana single, other big singles for the year included Jewel's You Were Meant for Me, Puff Daddy's I'll Be Missing You, and also Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart, R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly, of course from Space Jam, En Vogue's Don't Let Go, Mark Morrison's Return at the Mac, Leanne Rimes' How Do I Live, and the Spice Girls' Wannabe. In country music, Garth Brooks played to over one million fans at a free concert in Central Park in New York City. Shania Twain released her album Come On Over, which became the biggest-selling country album of all time. Other big albums included George Strait's Carrying Your Love With Me, Leanne Rimes' Unchained Melody, The Early Years, and also You Light Up My Life inspirational songs, Tim McGraw's Everywhere, Trisha Yearwood's Songbook, A Collection of Hits, Garth Brooks' Sevens, Brooks and Dunn's The Greatest Hits Collection, Colin Ray's The Best of Colin Ray Direct Hits, and Tracy Lawrence's The Coast is Clear. Trisha Yearwood and Leanne Rimes both recorded versions of the song How Do I Live for the Nicolas Cage movie Con Air. Rimes was asked to record it first, but the record label thought that her voice sounded too young for the song, so they got Trisha Yearwood to sing it. Both versions ended up being released, and while Leanne Rimes' version hit number two on the pop charts, Trisha's version made it big on the country charts. Tim McGraw and Faith Hill's song, It's Your Love, became the first song to spend six straight weeks at number one on the country music charts in 20 years. Other artists with big country songs included Shania Twain's Love Gets Me Every Time, Kevin Sharp's Nobody Knows, George Strait's One Night at a Time, Deanna Carter's How Do I Get There, Clay Walker's Rumor Has It, Kenny Chesney's She's Got It All, Garth Brooks's Long Neck Bottle, Brooks and Dunn's A Man This Lonely, and Reba McIntyre's How Was I to Know. In hip-hop, P. Diddy and the Family's No Way Out was one of the biggest albums of the year. Other big albums were Notorious B.I.G.'s Life After Death, The Wu-Tang Clan's Wu-Tang Forever, Tupac's Are You Still Down, 
Bone Thugs and Harmonies, The Art of War, Mace's Harlem World, and Masterpiece, Ghetto D. Two songs from P. Diddy's album both went to the top of the charts, I'll Be Missing You and Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, while All About the Benjamins went to number two. The late Notorious B.I.G. hit number one posthumously with Hypnotized and Mo Money, Mo Problems. Other big hip-hop songs included Bone Thugs and Harmonies, Look Into My Eyes, DeBratz's Ghetto Love, Scarface's Smile, Mace's Feel So Good, Busta Rhymes' Dangerous, Coolio's See You When You Get There, Timbaland's and Magoo's Up Jumps the Boogie, and Warren G's I Shot the Sheriff. In dance music, the famed Hacienda Club in Manchester, England was shut down due to bad behavior at the club, including shootings and a fatal drug overdose. The first Electric Daisy Carnival Music Festival took place, not in its recent location of Las Vegas, but in its original location of Los Angeles. Dance music was dominated on the charts by pop and R&B artists like Tony Braxton, U2, Madonna, Kenny G, Janet Jackson, George Michael, Mariah Carey, Usher, and P. Diddy. And even though those artists were all over the number one dance charts, there were more quote-unquote legit EDM artists who also made an impact. For instance, Daft Punk released their debut album Homework and also their landmark songs Defunk and Around the World, which all went to number one. The Chemical Brothers put out their album, Dig Your Own Hole, while Bjork released Homogenic. Faithless's classic song, Insomnia, I Can't Get No Sleep, was also at the top of the dance charts, as were the prodigies Smack My Bitch Up, Olive's You're Not Alone, Funky Green Dog's Fired Up, Moby's James Bond theme, Sasha's Ecuador, Ultranati's Free... Todd Terry's Something Going On, and Robert Miles' Fable. DJ Mag had its first Top 100 DJs list voted on by readers and not by music critics. The top 10 that year were Carl Cox, Paul Oakenfold, Sasha, Judge Jules, Tony DeVitt, Pete Tong, Danny Rampling, Hype, Groove Rider, and Jeremy Healy. In Latin music, the biggest artists of 1997 were Julio and Enrique Iglesias, Grupo Limite, Selena, Shakira, Luis Miguel, Gypsy Kings, Juan Gabriel, Los Temerarios, y Los Del Rio, who went back to the Macarena well to try to repeat the success of their 1996 smash hit Macarena, this time with Macarena Nonstop. In theater, musicals that opened in 1997 included Titanic, Dream, The Scarlet Pimpernel, Jekyll and Hyde, and The Lion King. Musical revivals that opened in 1997 included 1776, Candide, and Annie. The Spice Girls movie Spice World came out in December of 1997 and then, of course, made it big in 1998. There were other music films released, though. For instance, you had Selena starring Jennifer Lopez. You had the documentaries Year of the Horse about Neil Young and Crazy Horse and Rhyme and Reason about hip hop. There were also the animated musicals Anastasia, Cats Don't Dance, and Disney's Hercules. There was also the Disney Channel movie Cinderella, which starred Brandy as the title character and Whitney Houston as the fairy godmother. And even though they were black women playing what were traditionally white European fantasy roles, no one made a big deal about it. Unlike 2023's Little Mermaid's Black Mermaid. Welcome to the new world, people. Bands that formed in 1997 included Coldplay, Buckwheat Boys, Death Cab for Cutie, Destiny's Child, Eiffel 65, Gym Class Heroes, Interpol, Plain White Tees, New Found Glory, The New Radicals, Solar Stone, Venga Boys, Yin Yang Twins, and The White Stripes. Bands who broke up before, of course, their inevitable reunions or who announced their hiatus Included, except My Bloody Valentine, Bonham, Lowlife, The Kinks, 
Big Audio Dynamite, Lodestar, New Riders of the Purple Sage, Obituary, Quad City DJs, The Rembrandts, Dinosaur Jr., The Power Station, EMF, Rainbow, Real to Real, Dia Tribe, Bread, The Cocktoo Twins, The Fugees, The Gin Blossoms, Ghost Town DJs, Ugly Kid Joe, Throwing Muses, and Soundgarden. Bands that reformed in 1997 included Blondie, Depeche Mode, Echo and the Bunnymen, Jane's Addiction, and Sunny Day Real Estate. Artists who were born in 1997 included DJ Alan Walker, rappers Coy LeRae, and Lil Yachty, Rico Nasty, Blueface, Cupcake, Asian Doll, Kodak Black, 070 Shake, and Larissa Manoban, and singers Young Kook of BTS, Camila Cabello, Becky G, Her, Rose from Blackpink, Ruby Rose, Bella Thorne, Rebecca Black, Dina Lane from Fifth Harmony, Park Jimin, Zara Larson, Phineas O'Connell, Georgia Smith, and Youngblood. Artists who passed away in 1997 included the notorious B.I.G., who was shot and killed. Also, singers Towns Van Zant, Michael Hutchins of In Excess, who committed suicide, John Denver, who died in an experimental plane crash, Jeff Buckley, who drowned to death, Fela Kuti, Laura Nero, Laverne Baker, Nicolette Larson, Ronnie Lane, Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Witherspoon, Johnny Copeland, Thelma Carpenter, Billy McKenzie of The Associates, Ron Holden, Lawrence Payton of the Four Tops, guitarist Randy California, Luther Allison, and Michael Hedges, Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, opera singer Charles Craig, conductor George Solti, drummer Tony Williams, and jazz violinist Stefan Grappelli. In awards for the music of 1997, Bob Dylan's Time Out of Mind won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards, while Sean Colvin's Sonny Came Home won Song and Record of the Year. Paula Cole also won Best New Artist that year. The ceremony is probably better known for when New York actor Michael Portnoy went on stage shirtless during Bob Dylan's performance of his song Love Sick and started dancing with the words Soy Bomb written on his bare chest before, of course, being escorted off stage by security. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Jamiroquai won Video of the Year for Virtual Insanity. Leanne Rimes won Artist of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards. The Spice Girls were the big winners at the American Music Awards. Erica Badu was the big winner at the Soul Train Music Awards. Whitney Houston, Reba McIntyre, and Garth Brooks won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Dublin, Ireland, Katrina and the Waves from England won for the song Love Shine a Light. Katrina and the Waves were also one of the better-known Eurovision contestants since Celine Dion back in 1988. With Katrina and the Waves having found commercial success in 1985 with the hit song Walking on Sunshine. Garth Brooks won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and he also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. The Verve won Best British Album for Urban Hymns, and All Saints won Best British Song for Never Ever at the Brit Awards. Sarah McLaughlin won Best Album for Surfacing, and she also won Best Song for Building a Mystery at the Juno Awards. Savage Garden won Album of the Year for their self-titled album, and also Song of the Year for Truly Madly Deeply at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Titanic won Best Musical, and Chicago won Best Revival of a Musical. Musically at the Academy Awards, My Heart Will Go On from Titanic won Best Song. Best Film Score was split that year into two different categories. Anne Dudley's The Full Monty Score won Best Film Score for Musical or Comedy, while James Horner's score for Titanic won Best Dramatic Film Score. The Pulitzer Prize for Music went to Blood on the Fields by Wynton Marsalis, who became the first jazz artist to win that award. 
Ronnie Size and Represent won the Mercury Prize for the album New Forms, and Paul McCartney was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on May 6th at the Renaissance Cleveland Hotel in Cleveland, Ohio, for the first time since 1986 when the ceremony had always been held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. There was some drama before the ceremony as Buffalo Springfield inductee Neil Young didn't show up for the induction because he was protesting people having to pay $1,500 per plate to be inducted. He was also protesting that the ceremony was being broadcasted on VH1. Fellow Buffalo Springfield bandmate Stephen Stills was inducted twice that evening, once as a member of Buffalo Springfield and once as a member of Crosby, Stills & Nash. At the ceremony, the hall inducted King Records founder Sid Nathan into the non-performers category. Mahalia Jackson and Bill Monroe were inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category... The Hall inducted the Bee Gees, Buffalo Springfield, Crosby, Stills & Nash, Joni Mitchell, The Young Rascals, Parliament Funkadelic, and this next group. The Jackson Five were formed in Gary, Indiana. It consisted of brothers Jackie, Tito, Jermaine, Marlon, and their little brother Michael, who would of course eventually go on to have his own successful solo career, which turned out okay except for the ending. Their father Joe had a dream of being a professional boxer, but put that all aside in order to support his family, taking a job as a crane operator in the Gary, Indiana area. Joe also had dreams of being a musician. He started a band called the Falcons with his younger brother Luther and their friend Pookie Hudson, but the band broke up. Hudson started his own group, which became the doo-wop group, the Spaniels, who had the hit song Good Night, Sweetheart, Good Night. As with a lot of parents who had dreams that didn't work out for one reason or another, Joe pushed his musical dreams onto his sons. He was an extreme taskmaster who would make the brothers practice for hours on end in order to hone their craft. To some people, his behavior with his family bordered on abuse. These days, that would at least get you a visit from child services. This was the 1960s, however, so no. The J5, as they are sometimes called, started playing talent shows and then started doing theater shows like Harlem's Apollo Theater. It was at the Apollo that Gladys Knight first heard them and sent their demo tape to Motown Records, where their tape was actually rejected the first time. They were signed instead to a small record label called Steeltown Records. The J5 recorded the songs Big Boy and We Don't Have to Be Over 21 to Fall in Love with Steel Town. They performed as the opening act for the group Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's at the Regal Theater in Chicago, Illinois. Bobby was so impressed with them that he arranged for the J5 to get a second shot with Motown. He set up an audition where this time president and owner Barry Gordy listened to their audition tape and again Motown turned them down. This time though the reason was simple. They didn't want a young act because they already had a young act. A teenager by the name of Little Stevie Wonder. However, after thinking about it for a little while, Motown decided to take a chance and sign the band to a contract. In 1969, they recorded and released their first full-length debut album called Diana Ross Presents the Jackson Five. Fellow Motown artist Diana Ross had become the group's caretaker of sorts for Motown in order to get the group acclimated to the Motown assembly line way of doing things and to also get them, of course, some extra publicity because who doesn't like extra pub? That album had one release, but it was a big one. It was their number one smash single, I Want You Back. In the next six years, they put out 14 albums for Motown Records, including a live album, a Christmas album, a soundtrack album, and a 1971 Greatest Hits album, which coincidentally was the very first album that I ever bought that wasn't considered a kid's album like Sesame Street. 
Just saying. 1975's Moving Violation was the last studio album that they put out on the Motown label. They also released 17 singles that hit the Billboard Top 100's chart. Out of those 17 songs, their first four songs hit number one, and they had three others that hit number two. The group had hits on Motown like ABC, I Want You Back, Stop the Love You Save May Be Your Own, I'll Be There, Mama's Pearl, Never Can Say Goodbye, Maybe Tomorrow, Dancing Machine, Going Back to Indiana, and Sugar Daddy. They also became teen idols with a TV variety show that introduced their sister Janet to America at a very young age and a Saturday morning cartoon show. Meanwhile, Michael developed a solo career, putting out four solo albums and getting a couple of solo hits, the theme song to the horror movie Ben, and also the song Got to Be There. In 1976, the group left Motown Records for Epic Records. Jermaine Jackson left the group and stayed with Motown, having a decent solo career, and also he left the group because he was married to Barry Gordy's daughter. Jermaine was replaced by the youngest brother in the family, Randy Jackson. The Jackson Five became known as the Jacksons and put out six albums. They had 13 more singles hit the Billboard Top 100 singles chart, with three of those hitting the top ten, including Shake Your Body, Heartbreak Hotel, Lovely One, Enjoy Yourself, Can You Feel It, Torture, and State of Shock. Of course, during that time, they had their lead singer, Michael, break out and have a Hall of Fame career of his own, which also helped the group's album sales. After their first two albums for Epic Records sputtered in America, they finally hit pay dirt with the 1978 album Destiny, which had the hit Shake Your Body on it. Michael then released his solo album Off the Wall in 1979, which sold 9 million copies. After that success, the Jacksons released Triumph, which had the hits Heartbreak Hotel and Lovely One. Then Michael released Thriller in 1982, after the Jacksons had put out a live album in 1981. And we all know how well Thriller sold. It is coincidentally still the biggest selling album worldwide by far, and since album sales are no longer the way people purchase their music, that record will probably stand for generations. Even though Michael did not want to get back together with his brothers, his family talked him into it, mainly his mom, so they released the album Victory in 1984 and went out on the Victory Tour with Michael which that tour was actually a financial disaster due to mismanagement, but not due to popularity, as ticket sales were really brisk for that tour. After that, though, Michael was officially done with the group and his brothers and went off to make the albums Bad and Dangerous, along with becoming fodder for the tabloids and the criminal justice system on child molestation charges that he was acquitted of, at least in the criminal court system, but not, of course, in the court of public opinion, and we all know what happened after that. The Jacksons, meanwhile, broke up but got back together without Michael to release 1989's 2300 Jackson Street, which didn't actually sell well again. But they then broke up yet again and then got back together again to tour in the mid-2010s. The group actually still tours to this day, albeit without Michael, because as we all know, his ending was not a good one. He passed away in 2009. What makes the Jackson 5 so important to music is that they were one of the first family groups to achieve success. From them, other family groups, both real, like the Osmond brothers and Donnie and Marie Osmond, and fictional, like the Partridge family, would rise up in pop culture. They were one of the first African-American groups to have international mainstream crossover success. They also pioneered what became known as bubblegum soul by combining the sounds of the 1950s and 60s vocal groups along with R&B and soul artists like James Brown. They were nominated for three Grammy Awards, winning none of them. However, three of their songs have been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. I'll Be There, I Want You Back, and ABC. They received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1980. 
They were then inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They were inducted in as the Jackson 5, not the Jacksons. And since the Hall made that distinction and did not recognize them also as the Jacksons, that unfortunately meant that Randy Jackson was not included with his brothers since he was not in the group until after the name and label change in the mid-1970s. Although, let's be honest, he deserves to be in with his brothers. Inducted into the hall by Diana Ross of the Supremes, who were inducted in 1988, Michael Jackson, Tito Jackson, Marlon Jackson, Jermaine Jackson, and Jackie Jackson. The Jackson Five, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, class of 1997, and we have put a selection of their music onto our podcast music playlist for this one the link of which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcast, the Music History Today podcast, where we go over the events, music releases, births, and passings for that day in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops each and every day, including on the weekends, on this channel, the Music History Today Network, and also on our Music History Today Network YouTube page. Now, back to the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we're going to look at the case for putting the band Blue Oyster Cult into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As is usually the case, to the tale of the tape we go. Blue Oyster Cult released 15 studio albums, 7 live albums, 21 compilation albums, 1 soundtrack album, and 1 box set. Of those, 5 hit the top 40, although none of them hit the top 10. The best charting one was actually 1975's live album, On Your Feet or On Your Knees, which hit number 22. They also released 32 singles. Of those, 7 hit the top 40 on the American Singles Chart. Of those 7, 3 hit the top 10, including 1986's Dancing in the Ruins, which went to number 9, and two classic rock radio and streaming station stalwarts, 1976's Don't Fear the Reaper, which hit number 7 on the cash box chart, and 1981's Burning for You, which hit number 1 on the mainstream rock chart. They've also sold over 25 million records worldwide. As for why the group should be inducted into the hall, aside from their commercial success, there are a few reasons. For starters, they were one of the most influential and pioneering heavy metal groups of all time. Some of the groups whom they've influenced include Metallica, Iron Maiden, Queens of the Stone Age, and Ghost. They were one of the first hard rock heavy metal bands to achieve both critical acclaim and commercial success. They were also one of the first groups to have three of their music videos in heavy rotation on MTV back in 1981, including the music video for Burning For You. Plus, how many times have you heard Burning For You or Don't Fear The Reaper in movies or on TV shows? Their songs are a part of pop culture, yet no love from the Hall voters. That needs to change. Blue Oyster Cult, both for their commercial and critical success, should be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we have also put some of their music onto this week's podcast playlist, just so you could understand just how good they really were. The link, of course, is in the show notes. Each week in this spot, we highlight a different musical Hall of Fame or museum, since there's a bunch more than just the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's, for instance, the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Blues Hall, the Grammy Museum, among many others. This time, though, we're going to talk about one that isn't a hall per se. However, to me, it's probably the most important. The Library of Congress, aside from being a place in the movie All the President's Men, is the nation's library. 
Established in April of 1800, it has more than 38 million books, 14 million photographs, 70 million manuscripts, and 5.5 million maps. From a musical standpoint, it's important for a couple of reasons. The first is that it has over 8 million pieces of sheet music and over 3.5 million recordings. The second and more important reason is what it does with certain recordings. Since the passage of the National Recording Preservation Act of 2000, the library has developed a registry to preserve and protect certain pieces of music and other recordings that are considered historically relevant. That's a pretty high honor, knowing that your song or album is so important to the nation that it needs to be preserved forever. This is a pretty high class list you're joining here. Some of these recordings are actually speeches or radio shows from yesteryear. For instance, the earliest recorded version of Abbott and Costello's classic Who's on First Comedy Sketch, Orson Welles' War of the World's radio broadcast, which scared a whole lot of people back in the day, and Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech are in the registry as are the first recordings on cylinders that Thomas Edison used to show off the phonograph at an exhibition. The first official class was in 2002. There were 50 recordings that were declared important, and all of the above-mentioned recordings were in that very first class. There are certain artists who transcend their respective musical genres. Johnny Cash was one such artist. His chosen genre was country, for which he is considered an icon. He's also had gospel, blues, and folk songs, along with some rock and roll songs from his days at Sun Records. His rebellious rock and roll swagger earned him the nickname The Outlaw. His all-black stage outfits earned him another nickname, The Man in Black. His lifestyle was pure rock and roll. In short, he lived life his way. In 1951, Johnny Cash was a staff sergeant serving in the United States Air Force in Landsberg, Bavaria, West Germany. Side note, while stationed there, it was his job to help decipher coded messages coming from the Soviet Union, and it was he who helped to intercept and decode a message mentioning that Soviet Union head Joseph Stalin had passed away. Anyway, Cash and his fellow servicemen watched a movie in a theater one night called Inside the Walls of Folsom Prison. It inspired him to write a song about the prison. He wrote his song by taking parts of a song that Gordon Jenkins recorded, Crescent City Blues, for which Cash paid $75,000 after a copyright infringement lawsuit. Good times. Cash was inspired to write the most famous line in the song, But I Shot a Man in Reno Just to Watch Him Die, by thinking of the worst thing one human could do to another. When he left the Air Force, he recorded his song, called it Folsom's Prison Blues, in 1955. Folsom Prison Blues became his signature song. Fast forward a little to the mid-1960s. As the mid-1960s went on, after years of success, Johnny Cash's career was in decline. For years, he had been abusing drugs, and his albums had not been selling well for the last few years. He eventually got treatment for his addictions for the first time around 1967. He would be on and off drugs a large number of times throughout his life. In 1967, his record label also changed leadership. During this corporate shakeup, Johnny's old producers were out and a new one, Bob Johnston, was in. The Johnston hire was strange because Bob was actually known as a guy who would often forget that he was being employed by the record label and would do things his own way, regardless of whatever the record labels wanted. It was at this point that Johnny decided to tell the label and Johnston about his idea of performing and recording prison concerts. Johnny Cash actually started doing prison concerts back in the late 1950s, but he hadn't recorded them for release. 
In fact, at one of these prison concerts, a young man serving time for robbery saw Cash performing and decided that when he got out of prison, he would learn to play the guitar and make it big. He was another country legend, Merle Haggard. The record label loved the idea of recording the prison concerts after Johnston beat them over the head about doing it. They put out two inquiries to two prisons, Folsom Prison and San Quentin. Johnny Cash's father, Reverend Ray Cash, was a priest, as it turns out, who counseled prisoners, and he also helped to put in a good word with prison officials, because who doesn't want a good word from a priest? Get you into heaven. Concerts were eventually held at both prisons, but Folsom Prison said yes first, so they were first up. Johnny got a band together consisting of his old Sun Records label mate and friend Carl Perkins. He also got the country music group, the Statler Brothers, Luther Perkins, W.S. Holland, and Johnny's wife, June Carter. Johnny's father, Reverend Ray Cash, also went to the prison, as did the concert's producer, Bob Johnston. They all checked into the El Rancho Hotel in Sacramento, California on January 10th, 1968. The group held a couple of days of rehearsal during which then-California governor and soon-to-be, in about a decade, President Ronald Reagan met with them and gave them his support. And then, on January 13th, 1968, the group held two concerts at Folsom Prison— one at 9.40 in the morning, and another one at 12.40 in the afternoon as backup, just in case the first one wasn't any good. As it turns out, it was actually the second one that wasn't good, as everybody was pretty tired after the first one. In fact, only two of the songs from the second concert made the original cut for the first album, Give My Love to Rose, and I Got Stripes. The master of ceremonies for the shows was Hugh Cherry, who opened the shows by telling the inmates that it was okay for them to applaud. Carl Perkins started the show with his hit song, Blue Suede Shoes. Then the Statler brothers performed the songs, Flower on the Wall and This Old House. After Cherry came back out to introduce Johnny, Cash went on stage, gave his now famous introduction, Hello, I'm Johnny Cash and started playing Folsom Prison Blues. At the line about killing a man in Reno just to watch him die, somehow, not surprisingly, the prisoners cheered and screamed. Good to see that rehabilitation was working. The rest of the concert went on as Cash performed a few more songs about prison and then some ballads. June Carter came out and did a couple of ballads with Johnny, and then Johnny took a break and June read a poem. Then Johnny came back out, did some more songs, and ended with the song Greystone Chapel. Overall, everybody seemed pretty pleased with the results. The album for the concert was released on May 6, 1968, with little promotional push from Columbia Records, who were concentrating more on pop artists at the time, and actually didn't give a whole lot of promotional money to country music artists, which is a shame. The album, which had 18 songs on it, hit the pop chart first and then hit the country charts. Eventually, the album hit number one on the country chart and went to number 15 on the pop chart. The only hiccup to the album happened due to really, really bad timing. The album was gaining in popularity when Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968. The record label edited the I Shot a Man in Reno line out of Folsom Prison Blues despite protests from Johnny Cash. Regardless, the album became a big hit for Cash and helped to rejuvenate his career. Coincidentally, another ex-Sun Records label mate would also rejuvenate his career during that exact same summer with a concert of his own. Elvis Presley with his televised concert for NBC television. For the record, Johnny's 1969 concert at San Quentin Prison album would also go to number one on the country music charts. At that point, 
the man in black was back. There have since been reissues and special editions of both albums, including a 19-song reissue in 1999 and a 51-track special edition in 2008. Johnny Cash's 1968 live album at Folsom Prison, inducted into the United States Library of Congress National Recording Registry in Washington, D.C. in 2003, and we have put that album and also the San Quentin Prison album on the podcast playlist. The link is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>